Let's imagine that you're interested in how the milk production of a mother cow is related to the milk production of her female calves. And yes, I know we're a little heavy on farm examples this week. We'll come back to why that, that, that's the case here in a moment. Anyways, imagine these two scenarios. One, where there is a direct predictive relationship between the mother and the child, and one where there is no such relationship. Right? In the scenario where there is some sort of relationship, you might expect to see a scatter plot kind of like this. Right? Whereas in a scenario where there isn't a relationship, these observations are just scattered all over the place. Right? And so now, in this first one where there is this kind of relationship, there seems to be a linear relationship here, right? And you can actually draw a line that fits this data. The slope of this line we call the correlation coefficient, or R. And it measures how strongly related these two different distributions are, right? The how, how, how easy it is to predict, right? How much strength you have in predicting a, um, a child calves milk production from the milk production of the mother. How do you actually compute this value if you have um, uh, 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 these two lists? Well, it's actually pretty easy. So if you have these two data sets, Right, you have data sets M and C in this particular example. We start com by computing the means of those two data sets, right? So let's say M bar and C bar. And then we can ask how likely it is for observations, paired observations of these two data sets to vary together. So first, we, we um, compute the, very, uh, the standard deviations, I'm sorry, SM and SC. And then we ask, again, how, how likely it is for those, um, uh, for those uh, observations to vary together. And we call this measurement the covariance. And so the covariance of M and C is just the sum of m minus m bar times c minus c bar over n minus 1. And now that we've got this covariance computed, we can go ahead and compute the correlation coefficient as the covariance of m and c over SM times SC. And so now that we've got this measurement R, what does that have to do with narrow sense heritability? Well, if we assume that there's no environmental variance, so sigma E square is zero, then we can actually directly compute H squared, little h squared from R based on the proportion of shared alleles. So if we're talking about a mother and her calf, then the calf inherited one half of the alleles from the mother. Remember, this is meiosis happening here. And so any correlation that we happen to find between the amount of milk the mother produced and the amount of milk that the calf produced is only half of the possible total narrow sense heritability, right? And so in this case, right, in this case where you have a parent to child relationship, then R equals H squared over two, right? The correlation we found is only half of the possible total heritability, or of course you could rearrange this and say that the total narrow sense heritability is twice the correlation that you found. Again, this is for a parent and child relationship. 
Correlations between half-siblings, first cousins, etc. can also be used to estimate H squared based on the proportion of alleles that are shared between those individuals. So, two quick points before we leave this. First, remember that this assumes that the environmental effects on this relationship are zero. And this assumption breaks pretty badly when we consider humans. For example, parents that grew up in food-sufficient households tend to also rear children that have that you know that that um, are in food-sufficient households, and so. If you um, are uh, studying a trait like height that is you know that is affected by nutritional status, right? You're going to see a correlation there that is not just due to this narrow sense heritability. And second, when we consider the correlation between full siblings or monozygotic twins. The correlation coefficient r lets us estimate the broad sense heritability. And so let's consider twins. Um, in monozygotic twins, they share all of the same alleles, but they share the same dominance and epistasis effects as well. And so the correlation coefficient is the broad sense heritability of a trait. Again, when we're looking at, I should say, monozygotic twins or identical twins. If you, um, um, uh, in, the, in, this, in the case of full siblings, right, brothers and sisters from the same parents, for example, the situation is a little more complicated. There's still some dominance and epistasis uh, relationships that are shared here, but only on average half of those alleles are shared. And so on average, the correlation coefficient is about half of the broad sense heritability. Okay, all of this is well and good. What can we do with it? What can we do with this information? Well, in an agricultural setting, we can actually use them to chart the course of a breeding program using artificial selection. And in the context of human genetics, we can use these ideas around broad and narrow sense heritability to identify the genetic loci that are responsible for complex traits, which is a huge first step to understanding their molecular underpinnings. Artificial selection and QTLs are our final topics.